Uh, hello, fellow guitarists. Um, that was a uh, chorus of the blues in the key of G and uh, kind of a basic chord pattern, which most of you already know. And uh, to uh, start uh, this tape, I thought I'd play a little couple of courses of the blues. Actually, it was three courses, I think. Uh, and um, if you notice, I played a little intro. And in the course of my uh, seminars and uh, clinics, uh, for the lack of a better word, clinics, I feel like I'm a doctor or something. Uh, uh, I notice a lot of young guitarists that are very good players, but don't seem to know some of the basic uh, procedures in uh, playing with a group or playing professionally or playing uh, before an audience. Uh, uh, and one of the things is like learning to take and knowing how to take an intro or taking an intro. I took a little intro uh, on that blues just to show you that you should know how to take an intro on a tune or have some, and it's not necessarily a chordal intro, it can be any kind, it can be single lines, it can be chords, combination, it can be, a, that happened to be, I think, a six bar intro. It can be a four bar, generally it's a four bar or eight bar intro. And uh, also, uh, one of the other things that the players don't uh, seem to do strong enough that I noticed uh, is that ending a tune, like kind of jamming the last eight bars or last four bars out, knowing uh, uh, like a... You know? Kind of knowing how to end a tune. It's, it's quite important. It's, it kind of shows uh, where you're at uh, in your... Uh, playing or career or whatever. Uh, now that was a basic blues uh, pattern in the key of G. Key of G is a good key for the guitar. And um, while I'm at it, a couple other things. Uh, if you're a solo guitar player, keep out of the key of E and A and D. Uh, play a couple tunes or one or two tunes in those keys, but do not play more than one or two tunes together in the key of E, A, and D, because my theory is that you start getting the drone sound of the E and A and D, and it doesn't matter what you play, how beautiful the chords are, and those chords can be very beautiful in the key of E and A and D because you have open strings, but you'll put an audience to sleep, and yourself too, so always try to play, if you play in the key of A, play maybe the next piece in the key of C or E flat or B flat. Even though we all know that those are the prettiest sounding keys on the guitar. That was just an aside, it had nothing to do with the blues. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, chord patterns and blues and, what, uh, and I'm using the blues as a format and what to, uh, what to uh, this is sort of off the top of my head, and what what to do with a chord, blues chord pattern, or what I would do with a blues chord pattern. So basically, I think we all know the three chords that go into the blues. Uh, in the key of G, I'll play uh, maybe a um, twelve bars to show you. Uh, <coughs> the basic pattern. So well, here we go. Like that. 
Now, when I have a one chord, you can always use the five chord, so. You can always interchange the one chord with the five chord, and that gives you some motion. But so basically you have G, C seventh, which is a, a change that you necessarily don't have to use, but I do, and most of the, uh, let's say, uh, big city blues players have this kind of a pattern. The C seventh, lots of times you go. There's no change involved there except just a half step. You can always move a half step into your chord. You can always play half step above the, the chord that you're playing. If it's G, you can always move A flat into G, which by the way, A flat is the flat five of G, or the flat five of D rather, and D seventh is the five of G, so. See the same voicing? Anyway, so here's, I have to take that to a higher plateau. I like that word, plateau. Uh, let's see. So now, uh, well, we, already, we already did that. We, we uh, ad added some uh, color tones, I call them, added ninths and thirteenths. So now I'm going to change the pattern a little bit. Uh, same pattern, G, and then before I go to the C ninth, I will play D flat ninth, which you can always play a half step into the chord, which is also the flat ninth of G. Now you're on your C ninth, so normally you would, if you didn't know, you would go. So now, in order to add some harmony to it, and by the way, when you add other harmonies, other chord changes, that enables you to play your lines also, which uh, extend the harmonies in your single note playing too. Now, I'm going back to G, so what I will do here is play F sharp. F sharp seventh because F sharp seventh is a half, half tone above G. We have this. That's normal. Now this is F sharp seventh is F sharp seventh with a sixth or a thirteenth in it and a flat nine, but it works there because it's the root of G. It's G root. And if you look at my hand, you can see that I'm playing the same three notes. So I have a root here, G. So you see, uh, on the guitar, a lot of playing is uh, with forms and continuity, kind of keeping everything in the same place, in the same... Uh, it's not as mysterious as it may appear if you don't associate it with a form or a, a pattern. And as I said in my last tape, everything I play from is a bar form, a bar. So I'm always connected with a bar. In this case, F sharp seventh is bar here. And it's the bar form of, uh, the E form of F sharp, but that's another subject. So we go back to the top again. D flat, going to C seven. D flat is a kind of a D flat ninth or a thirteenth. Has to be a dominant sound. Should, has to be, it cannot be a major seventh sound. C ninth to F sharp seventh with the sixth and the flat nine, which is the root of G. Back now we're going to go to D seventh, which is the five of G. Now we once again.
again, we're going to C9, so we play a D flat because you can always move. You can always do that. Sometimes you can change the root. Instead of having a D flat root, you have a G root. D flat is a flat five of G, so they can work. What you have is this. These are the same. Dominant. Seventh, third, and seventh. There, it once again, is the... So you go. Now we're back on C9. Back on C9. Now we can play a C sharp diminished before we go back to the uh, G. Seven. C sharp diminish. And if you put a root on the C sharp diminished, you have once again your G flat seventh chord without the sixth. So if you if you see these things all all, all are the same. They're up they, they're not mysterious or they're not any kind of uh uh, uh deviation from what basic chord changes are. I mean, they're not like things where most players, if you played them and uh, who, who have played for a while, would understand and know right away what you're doing. So it's not like something you would have to explain to someone. So these are just basic jazz chord patterns that have gone down through the, since I guess, uh, I don't know when, since Louis Armstrong or before. They're in all kinds of music, not only jazz. And theoretically, it's in every book you could... If you were to examine this theoretically, you would see that it's all correct. So that is now an F-sharp 7th or a C-sharp diminished. Now we're back to G. Now we're going to a C-7th to a B-7th, raise ninth to an E-7th, a minor. Now you notice that I keep a, a certain tone. C ninth. I have a D here. B seventh. I have a D here. I keep a pedal tone. E seventh. I have a D here. A minor. I have a D here. D seventh. I have a D here. G. Now that is a, a little uh, variation on the blues. So let me see. What I want to do now is uh, repeat the uh, two 12-bar uh, blues patterns for you to give you some idea of uh, the little substitutions or chords that I've added. So in order to place them in, in perspective, I will first play the basic pattern for you again so you know kind of where we are and where we're going. So here, I'll do a little bit brighter. Here's your five chord, just to add a little color. I'm adding some, some more tones. That's the 12 bars. Now I'm going to add kind of the more added substitute changes. D flat, G flat, D seventh, raise ninth, D minor, seventh, G seventh, C ninth, half step higher, the D flat, diminish, which is also G flat, G seventh, C seventh, B seventh, E seventh, a minor seventh, D seventh, E flat seventh, D seventh, that's one beat, G seventh, D seventh. So that is your basic pattern. Now I will repeat that pattern again and just play some other changes, but basically the same chord, but just some other voicings, let's say. It's now this voicing, instead of playing a G, I'm playing a G 13th. D flat 7 flat 5, instead of C 9th. D 
G7, D7, raise 9, raise 5. Now I'm going to add the, when you have, uh, I know many of you know about the 2-5, uh, the 5 chord that is like D minor to G7. So I do that. D flat ninth, C ninth. You can move, I told you, three steps. Diminish. G seventh, C ninth. This is now B seven raise nine raise fifth. This is E seventh raise nine. Now you can do it here too. Then it's A minor. E flat ninth, D ninth. Sus, the words G7, sus. Now I'm gonna do a different turnaround. Instead of doing this turnaround, which is a basically uh, a five chord turnaround, I will do a two five, I think it's. A. B minor, E seventh, A minor, D seventh. And then now you're back at the top. So it's. Now you're back at the top. Now, let's see, how can I go to explain? Well, one thing you must do when you play chords, whether it's the blues or whatever the tune is, as I said before, you must keep some continuity in your voicing. You don't play changes uh, that are not connected in some way, either with a pedal tone. I have a pedal tone in that case, D. This is G, this is D flat. This is C ninth, this is B augmented, B seventh, B seventh, raise nine, raise five, or raid, uh, and this is E minor. You see, I always have a pedal tone. So either you keep a pedal tone in your chord or you keep a voice movement, voice leading. This would be B minor seventh, this would be E seventh, A minor, D seventh, G. E7, E7, A7, D7, here, G, E7, A7, D7. So I have, I have a voice leading, I have a voice movement, I have a, a melodic line moving on my chords, and you have to have that because when you're uh, uh, playing changes, which is a little bit, I'm diverting a little bit from the subject of the blues, but when you're playing chord changes for another soloist, or whether it's a horn player or a, or a piano player or another guitar player, you're not just playing chord changes for this soloist. So you don't think in terms of, well, I have the chords are A, G, F, B, so I just play these chords and wait for my turn to play, which is a lot of guys do you are actually supposed to be enhancing his playing, feeding him chords, and you're actually supposed to be creating kind of a, a little melodic chordal movement yourself. I mean, it's not just, I'll play these chords and wait until it's my solo. That Playing those chord changes uh, is just as uh, rewarding if you're listening to what you play as it is playing a solo with a million notes or three notes or whatever. Playing the changes, so remember, repeat that, playing the changes is as rewarding if you're listening to what you're doing and moving voices around and trying to make good harmonies just as much as playing a, a solo, I find it for me. So now in the blues, I'll do the, I'll do the, the chord pattern that I give the second one, which is a little bit more sophisticated than the basic ones. It was kind of bebop blues. And and I'll play a couple of courses with chord changes, voice leading, and pedal tones. 
So we start with G. That's a voice leading. sharp G D seventh all pedal tone that's voice That's a little bit of voice leading, a little bit of pedal tone. And if you notice, I'm using a lot of the same forms. I call them grips, a lot of the same grips. I'm not playing anything that's like uh, really strange kind of chord changes. They're all bar forms and all basically chords that uh, all guitar players learn and know. They're, see, this is everybody, can, even if you play with a pick, you can play this chord. So that's one, uh, another basic blues pattern. The substitutions are flat five, D flat going into C, and the substitutions on the, uh, one, coming out of the, the uh, whatever bar that is, I can't remember. Uh, instead of staying on the G, you go to C ninth two beats, B seventh two beats, E seventh two beats, and A minor seventh. You're just doing a pattern. Here's a here's a here's another pattern. It's almost the same pattern. Here's substitution. That is okay. That is my substitution is C B. C7, B7, E7, A. Now, a lot of times in the blues, I substitute dominant sevens for minor sevens. A lot of guys play. That's the first uh, two bars. I play C9 substitution in place of this. But this is a pattern, too. It's kind of a different, kind of more lightweight. I like mostly, uh, I think blues are based around real strong dominant seventh sounds. Now, um, so uh, let me give you some examples of uh, the same thing. That's the D flat. If you if you made it a ninth, it would be F sharp seventh ninth. But that doesn't sound good. So that's why it's important important to make sure that when you play chords that there's common tones in the chords, one you're coming from and one you're going to. Either you're making a moving voice or you're you have a pedal tone, which is. Those are four chords. C seventh, F sharp. No, there was a D flat, which is a common tone. C seven, but it has a common tone of B flat in it. F sharp seventh, which is a common tone, which is F sharp seventh or F sharp diminished. And then G ninth, seven, raised ninth, which has a common tone. So now I can get away with playing these. But if I were to play them this way, 
Uh, let's see. Those are the same chords, but they don't, they won't hang together, they won't sound right, they'll sound weird, so. Okay, here we go, I keep digressing, because it's okay. one, two, three, four. Always count one, two, three, four, I don't know why. <laughs> Seven, F sharp seven. Here come some patterns. B seven. Now there's C, C, B. Same form E. Same form A. Now I told you I substitute a dominant seventh for a minor seven. That normally in your books is a minor seven. B seven, E seven, which is a flat five. A minor, but I substitute. So, if you notice, I'm using the same form. I just changed the root. So, you can always move chord changes either chromatically or through a cycle. That's a 2-5. All dominants. Those are all dominants. Or you can move them chromatic. The key to, uh, to uh, that's a very simple concept. You can move chromatically or 2-5, and we all know that in books that's written. But the key to making it sound like you're doing something and it sounds good and it, it is the voicing, the chord voicings that you use is the key. If I or repeat, if you have a common tones in the chord or a, or a moving line, <laughs> same thing. It's the same thing. D7, listen. That's just adding Everything I play is from a bar. This is bar here would be here. It's this bar, the, the, the G form of... It's the G form. Anyway, that's getting off. So, let me see now, where, where was... Okay, another kind of a blues pattern is one that is, uh, goes like this. So it's G, F sharp seventh to B seventh, E minor to e, A seventh, D minor to G seventh, C major seventh, C minor seventh, B minor seventh to E seventh, B flat minor to E flat seventh, A minor seventh, D seventh, G. There's your turnaround, it's E, A, D. Now remember, I'm talking mostly about dominant seventh chords. So once, once again, except for the first chord of this tune, of this pattern, which is uh, kind of another blues pattern, which was uh, back in the 50s and 60s, the bebop days, where they wrote F sharp seven, E minor, A seven, two five, C major 7th, then they went to C minor, F7, B flat, B flat minor, E flat 7th, A flat major 7th, did I do that? A minor 7th, D7, seventh, G7, seventh, E7, seventh, A minor, G7, so it came out like this.
think I did two different ones. I did this, F sharp to B7, E minor to A7, D minor to G7, C major, C minor 7 to F7, B minor to E7, B flat minor to E flat 7, A minor to D7, A minor to D7 to G to G. That's the first one I did. Then I did something a little different. I just which you can take a lot of liberties with these kind of chord patterns, you know. In this, for instance, G, F sharp minor, B7, E minor, A7, D minor, G7, C. Now here you can change C minor, F7. Now instead of going to B minor, which is a 2-5 two, uh, uh, two pattern, you can go C minor, F7 to B flat major. You stay there for a bar. And then you go to B flat minor to E flat ninth for a bar. Then you go to A flat major seventh for a bar. And then you're back on A minor seventh, which is where you would be if you played the simple blues, if you played the uh, second set of changes that I told you about, or if you played this third set of changes, which I told you about, you would be, or this fourth set, at this point in the chord pattern you would be on A minor D7 exactly where you would be on all the other changes so you see you have to sort of uh, think a little bit and look a little bit at what you're playing and it, theoretically maybe you can figure it out but uh, I'm sure you could I don't bother with theory because it confuses me so here goes <laughs> set real simple turn around second set same chords C C minor F7 B flat major by the way, you can go like this. These are things on the guitar that you should know to do. Easy things. Never play anything that's hard. If it's hard, don't play it. The object of playing the guitar and making music, I think, is, is to be able to have motion and freedom and and play what you hear and what you feel and have some kind of flow and movement and not to show that wow i can do this real hard chord here and then once you do that you can't do anything else for for uh, you know a minute or two because you're so busy trying to play that so it's easy to and there are a lot of things on the guitar that are easy for instance uh, a lot of playing comes from the form that you use. And if you watch guitar players like uh, any of them, George Benson, uh, Pat Metheny, uh, uh, Larry Coryell, uh, George Van Epps, uh, Arlen Roth, if you watch all these different kinds of guitar players, you'll see that they're all using very much basically the same forms. There are certain forms on the guitar that sound good, that have a good uh, intervals between them. They have a good sound. They have a good. Uh, they're easy to play, and you can get the most out of them. And some of them are. Most of them are bar forms. Nines. These kind of chords. Very few guys play. Though, though there is a whole theory of playing. the kind of voicing that is uh, like saxophone voicing but most of the players use bar forms uh, chords that are really basic and not hard to grip or play and, and they have a lot of freedom in their play so a lot of the lines come out of those forms for instance uh, if I have this chord this is a, a real basic ninth chord and I know that it can be called E7, I know it can be called G7, 
Uh, I know it can be called something else. I forgot. There's four names to it, and I know if you change the root. be called D minor 7th, D minor 6th, E 7th raised to the flat 9, uh, G 7th, something else. But anyway, this, here's a form. It has a nice sound to it. And you can play lines out of the form without not playing a scale or an arpeggio. You're not playing an arpeggio because there's another way of gripping it, by the way. By the way, don't play any chords with four fingers that you can play with two or one. I mean, why tie up? I mean, I like this, but why? In many cases, you don't want to tie up all your fingers. You can't do anything. Everything is under your finger. happens to be an arpeggio but it, I don't think in terms of arpeggios a lot I play few of them because they fall under my fingers pretty good but I think in terms of scale lines so here You can get a lot out of the form that you're using, a lot of the lines and a lot of the uh, nice sounding lines, by the way, too, without playing just arpeggios or playing a scale. I know scales, when you play from root to root, they become scales and they're boring. So uh, in many, uh, in a lot of cases, I take a note like, I don't know if I put this on the last tape or not, but I take a note like that on the first or second string and I put a chord to that note. In this case, I'm putting C, major 7. Then I play from the root to that note. And this sounds like not, not a scale, but a kind of a line. Then I take another chord with the same note on top. In this case, F major 7. And then I play the scale from the root to the note. I put another chord, maybe a B flat 7th, 13th on it. Same note. I play from the root to the chord, to the note. And I'm having, I'm getting now kind of a lines instead of scales. If I play a raise ninth, E7, from the root. sound and you can go on forever uh, all kinds of chords changing the note and you start to get kind of a line sounds of lines and more than uh, than scales because scales I know uh, end up sounding like scales and, and you don't know what to do with them so if you take from a root to an interval you get one of these things and you can make these chords majors dominance minors Major. Now you will notice I start always on the root and I end always 
on the note that I picked, the same tone. That's a little digress digressing. Some of the things that I uh, try to do in seminars to try to open up, you, know, you should open up your ears a little bit. So let me see, we get back to the blues again, blues in G, and uh, I will play now little variations on blues in G. I'll try to slow them up a little bit. D7. All diminished chords can be used as dominant seventh chords, and this in this case is a D7 flat nine, which I earlier said don't use a flat nine in a blues, but I do, so I guess you can. It's just you have to watch where you use it. Don't use it in the blues in conjunction with a raised nine, so you don't want to have this sound. In other words, that. It's not against the rules, it's correct, but it just doesn't sound right. Once again. Diminished works. Half tone higher, half tone below. C. Five of G, turn around. Chromatic changes. Raise ninth. C seventh raise ninth flat ninth. Here comes a run. That is. That is this. The in between change in between G seventh and C seventh. Here it is on the top string. Here it is on the on the next string. That's in between G seventh and C going to C. Here we are in back. Diminished. That's your five chord. D seventh. That's this chord. That is the five chord, even though may look at it and call it other things a flat but it's the five chord if you had low D flat root so it's, but it's your E seventh turnaround with a B flat root here is the E A seventh D seventh which is an A flat flat five of D keep hitting this button business. Everybody has that in a book. But I play it this way. 
G, A minor. Now instead of going to B flat minor, to B minor, or a lot of you players go like this. Diminish. Some players go. I go. I go back. That's A flat suspension. Because I'm just doing this. I'm doing. So, but I'm I'm voicing it. That's the A minor. So there's a voice. There's another voice back. So this voice is going. This one is going, so it's. And that is simply G, A minor, A flat, G7, which is uh, de de derived from this business, which is kind of like some of the chord voicings that are used in early guitar books. And, Okay, let's start again. The blues in G. What's that? It's nothing. It's just G7 moving up to A flat. C7 moving up to D flat. Back to G7. Then D flat moving up to D. And why? Because the next change is C seventh. So. D flat. Now. You see, by using little little forms, common forms that are all guitar players know, and using your ears and keeping some kind of a motif, some uh, musical idea, you can play a lot of things that uh, are very musical in a sense that they are, and uh, and not hard to do. And the choice of, of making voicings and lines and that is infinite. That can go on forever. The better your ears are, the more you begin to hear the little things you can do. You don't have to do anything that's really difficult or really uh, complicated. So I will play a, a little piece for you on the blues and then get my plane.
Hi, I'm Woody Mann, and welcome to Hot Licks, The Blue Side of Jazz with Joe Pass. This enhanced DVD was originally released in VHS format in 1992. The updated DVD edition includes a special feature section with slow motion exercises, a selected discography, Joe's bio, a suggested listening list, and a chord dictionary section called The Chord Corner. On the blue side of jazz, Pass demystifies the art of jazz guitar in a practical, non-theoretical way and shows you how melodic and chordal movement can make the art of playing rhythm as rewarding as playing solo. He takes a blues in G, then he builds on it, then he deconstructs it, so you can see all the mechanics. He starts out with a very basic version of the progression, then he adds color tones, bass lines, chord sequences, pedal tones, and chord substitutions. He shows you everything from intros to accompaniment pointers, bebop blues, and endings. Joe does assume that you have at least a little bit of knowledge of chords and moves fairly quickly through some of the material. So if you find it difficult to keep up with the changes, try playing along with the slow motion section. This allows you to loop all the exercises at half speed, but the audio is restored to standard pitch. And if you have any trouble with Pass's chord fingerings, refer to the chord corner section. Here, this lets you hear each chord while seeing a photograph of the position along with the chord diagram. Once you get the basic chord vocabulary down, you should be ready to move along with Pass as he embellishes the blues. The Blue Side of Jazz was made as a follow-up to Joe Pass's first Hot Licks title, Solo Jazz Guitar. These two classic videos provide insight into the legendary musician who has played for some of the greatest band leaders of the 20th century. Leaders including Dizzy Gillespie, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Oscar Peterson, and Benny Goodman. For more on Joe's playing, try solo jazz guitar, which covers Pass's approach to chord melody and improvisation. But meanwhile, good luck with Joe Pass on the blue side of jazz.